Okay, well, good morning. Welcome back to our study in 2 Chronicles as we move into 2 Chronicles 17. And with this chapter, we begin a reign of a new king, Jehoshaphat. But before we look at this chapter verse by verse, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for another day you've given us to be here to open your word, to study these great truths. We pray you'll write them on our hearts and we live them out for your glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So 2 Chronicles 17, we start the reign of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat is one of the better kings in the southern kingdom that we see. You can put him up on maybe the line with Hezekiah and Josiah, as we will get to them later on. And speaking of Jehoshaphat, his reign is going to take us from chapter 17 through chapter 20. So we're going to spend four chapters focused on Jehoshaphat, which is more information than we're given in 1 Kings. And Jehoshaphat is provided with, at least in regards to Jehoshaphat, the Chronicle provides quite a bit of information here compared to a lot of the other kings. Now, as far as breaking this chapter down, I break it down into three sections. And this chapter seems to set up the other three chapters. It almost is per, uh, giving us an introduction to Jehoshaphat and his reign. So I break it down into verses 1 through 6, showing Jehoshaphat's strength. And we're going to see a combination of both physical strength of the kingdom and Josiah's spiritual strength. I mean, Jehoshaphat's spiritual strength. And they are probably tied together. The reason his kingdom is physically strong is because he is spiritually strong as a king. And then we see something very interesting, and 1 Kings does not cover this, but verses 7 through 9, we read that the teaching of the Word of God is going to permeate throughout the Judean cities. And this is going to be at the command of King Jehoshaphat. And then we come back to the idea of strength, and this time it seems to be more focused on the physical strength of Jehoshaphat i.e. the strength of his kingdom. So those three sections. Now, as far as a parallel section, there's not much in 1 Kings that covers this chapter. Basically, verse 24 of 1 Kings 15 basically tells us that Jehoshaphat takes over from his father Asa. So it is interesting as we compare the the theme of First and Second Kings to that of First and Second Chronicles. There's definitely a different emphasis. So let's jump into this. And the, the chapter is pretty straightforward, but we will look at the details here. Starting in verse number one, it says, Jehoshaphat, his son, then became king in his place. And remember, Jehoshaphat's father, we just covered him in chapters 14, 15, and 16, Asa. So Jehoshaphat takes over for him, and what we're going to see here is that, at least in this chapter and uh, the next couple chapters, is that the reign of Jehoshaphat is, in a way, going to parallel that of his father. You're going to see a lot of common themes between these two rulers. So you could say that, uh, like father, like son, here. So he becomes king, and then notice the second part of verse 17, or ver chapter 17, verse 1 and made his position over Israel firm. So we see that Jehoshaphat's strength in his kingdom is strong. Now, that preposition there, over, can be translated a couple different ways. It does have various meanings in Hebrew. The New American Standard translates it over Israel. I believe the New King James says against Israel. And commentators are divided. What Israel means here is this a reference to the northern kingdom, which is, I think, the emphasis of against. And remember, Asa, his father, had fought uh, just previously. We saw the battle against Basha, king of Israel. So it is a possibility to translate it against Israel. Or over Israel, like the New American Standard would suggest that Israel is speaking of the southern kingdom, or maybe just overall Israel in general, because remember, the southern kingdom is the legitimate kingdom in the fact that it has the legitimate worship, the Levitical worship system. It has the temple, has the priesthood there. And that's kind of the way I take it here. I believe it's referencing the southern kingdom. 
So Jehoshaphat is strong as he begins his reign over the southern kingdom. And we see in verse 2, the emphasis on the physical strength. And again, I think this ties into the spiritual strength that we're going to see. But it also shows, I believe, the blessings of the Lord. When the southern kingdom is strong, when it's able to build fortified cities, when it has a good military and there's peace in the land, that suggests that things are going well spiritually within the land. And that's laid out in the Mosaic Covenant. So we see in verse 2, He placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had captured. Now we're going to come back to this thought starting in verse 10. But just as a reminder, Ephraim here on our map, this is kind of in the middle between the southern and the northern kingdom. So we know Asa's reign was able to go a little bit north outside of the southern kingdom into Ephraim. And it seems to be that Jehoshaphat's reign continues to kind of push north, kind of push back against the northern kingdom of Israel. But now let's look at the spiritual strength of Jehoshaphat. Verse 3, it says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals. <clears throat> So we start off verse 3 with that very important point. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat. And that's why I believe the spirit, the physical strength that we see in this chapter follows the spiritual strength of Jehoshaphat. And that's explicitly stated we, we see with the because. Because he followed the example of his father David's earlier ways, or earlier days. He followed in David's footsteps. And remember, David was not a perfect king. He was not a perfect person. He sinned, he fell, but he also got back up and was right with the Lord. And David becomes this, really the standard which all kings were to strive to. And Jehoshaphat is one of the few kings that meets that Davidic standard. He followed the example of his father David. But notice the second part of verse 3 says, And he did not seek the Baals the false religious gods of the Canaanites, of the pagan nations there in the land. So once again, we see this emphasis on doing something and not doing something else. Doing a righteous thing and not doing an unrighteous thing. And that's reiterated in verse 4, which, what says, or where it says, but sought, again, uh, uh, coming off of verse 3, but sought the God of his father followed His commandments, and did not act as Israel did. And there's our word sought. We saw in King Asa's reign early on that he was one to seek the Lord. And now we see his son Jehoshaphat is seeking the Lord. But notice, in addition, it says he followed his commandments. And once again, we see the tie of, a, of an individual seeking God, but seeking God by seeking or following His Word. These two go hand in hand. And once again, we see what he did not do. He did not act as Israel did. And Israel, in this case, I would say, would be the northern kingdom in context. So he did not submit himself to idolatry and the pagan idols. And again, this led to physical strength. Verse 5, So the Lord established the kingdom in His control. And all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. So we see the prosperity of Jehoshaphat here because he was following the ways of God, and God was prospering him. And again, this goes back to the Mosaic Covenant. So we got to be a little careful how we apply this and just can't go around saying that if you just follow the ways of the Lord, God's going to make you rich, famous, and He's going to bring great honor to your name. Okay, Again, we're in a different dispensation. Again, this with Jehoshaphat is tied directly, I believe, to the Mosaic Covenant. So God is prospering him among His people. Verse 6, He took great pride in the ways of the Lord. 
or his heart was lifted very high. An idiom for this idea of taking pride. And he's taking pride notice in what? The ways of the Lord. He wasn't taking pride in himself. Sometimes when we do get riches or honor or fame, it's very easy to look at ourselves and think how great we are. You know, if we get a big job promotion or we, you know, win some kind of jiu-jitsu match, you know, we think how great we are. But notice here that temptation probably was there for Jehoshaphat. But what does he do? He takes pride in the ways of God. And again, it says, remove the high places in the Asherim from Judah. So like his father, and as the reason I, be I believe that the and again is there, like his father, he removed the high places, the Asherim, the, the pagan worship sites. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that there's two different instances where in Asa's reign, he went and removed these places of worship. So why did he have to do it a couple times? Well, I think they keep springing back up. They tear them down, and then what happens? They come back up. It's like, it's like weeds in your yard. You, know, you go through and you take out these weeds, and you're thinking, I got, I got rid of the weeds this year, and then what happens next year? They're there, and they're probably twice as many. And that's what happened, I believe, during Asa's reign. He would remove the high places. He would remove the, the pagan worship sites. And next thing you know, later on, they're back. And it seems to be that this is what Jehoshaphat was dealing with. His father went and did this. Now he's having to do it in his reign. But overall, things are going well in the southern kingdom and for Jehoshaphat. So we see in these first six verses the physical strength and the spiritual strength of Jehoshaphat. And then as I said, we move into the section where we see the Word of God permeating in the Judean cities. And this is something not recorded, I believe, in, in 1 Kings. It's unique here. Probably going back to the chronicler's perspective or his theme of emphasizing Levitical worship, true worship of God. And that worship has to revolve around the Word of God. So we see in verse 7, Then in the third year of his reign, and a lot of people believe that Jehoshaphat actually had a co-reign with his father Asa for three years. So this idea in the third year of his reign would be the first year of his independent reign. And by the way, a lot of scholars, uh, including Eugene Merrill, start his reign at 873 B.C., and take it to 848 B.C. So the third year would be roughly 870 B.C. here. So then in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials. And then he lists these officials. ben Hael, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, and Micaiah. And what does he send them to do? Notice the last part of verse 7 to teach in the cities of Judah. So he has these officials, and as we see in verses 8 and 9, he's going to add both the Levites and the priests, and they're going to go throughout all the cities of Judah teaching. But what are they teaching? Well, that's specified in verse 9, so we'll get there. But we have to look at the Levites and priests, verse 8. And with them the Levites, Shemaiah, Netaniah, Zebediah, and Asahel. She may remote Jehu Nathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and Tobadanijah, the Levites, and with them Elishima and Jehoram, the priests. So we have these three groups of people being commissioned and sent out by King Jehoshaphat. We have the officials in verse 7, and then we have the Levites and the priests in verse 8. So these are the ones being commissioned to go out to teach. And verse 9 shows us what they're teaching. They taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. Now most likely, the law of the Lord here would be the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. And they're taking these, and they're teaching the people the truths of God. And this is summarized at the end of verse 9, and they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. 
So Judah is experiencing physical strength. They have fortified cities. They're going to have a great army, which we're going to look at next. But they're also prospering spiritually because the Word of God is being spread. It's permeating through these Judean cities. And this, I believe, is one of the high points of the southern kingdom. And on a side note, not that we get our mission from this section of Scripture, but here at Tyndale, that's what we're trying to do as an institute and as a seminary, is we're trying to spread the Word of God. And we're doing it by training up others. Training up others to take, who not only learn the Word of God here at the school, but learn how to teach the Word of God so that they can go out and to teach others. And then our hope is that those people who are taught by our graduates would then teach others. And those would teach others. And you would see this force multiplication going on. And we see this with some of our, at least one of our graduates in, in Eastern Europe. He received his education here. And then he started his own Bible study group. And then people in there are teaching others. So we see this idea, this, this permeation of the Word of God. And that's what we're about here at Tyndale. And this is exactly what Jehoshaphat is commissioning. He's, he's teaching, he's having these people go out to teach the law of the Lord because he gets it. He knows the important aspect of reigning as king, and that is following the ways of God. And you follow the ways of God by following His Word. <clears throat> and I believe this is what's leading to this physical strength, which now we focus in on the rest of the chapter. Verse 10 says, now the dread of the Lord was on all the kingdoms on the, of the lands which were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. So Jehoshaphat's reign was strong, and that idea was picked up among the peoples who surrounded Judah. They knew that the Lord's people were not to be messed with. So it's a time of peace. It's a time of prosperity. And then we get a couple of examples of this in verse 11. Some of the Philistines brought gifts and silver as tribute to Jehoshaphat. And think about that for a minute. The Philistines. These people who have been at war with Israel all the way back into the time of the judges. They gave David a hard time. Now David gave them a hard time as well. But they have been nothing but a thorn to the, to the uh, Israelites. And here they are bringing gifts, bringing silver to Jehoshaphat. He is prospering. Just like verse 5 said, he had great riches and honor. But not only the Philistines, look at the rest of verse 11. The Arabians also brought him flocks. 7,700 rams. 7,000 700 male goats. Now these are probably tribute payments. But Jehoshaphat and the southern kingdom are being greatly blessed by the surrounding nations. And then starting in verse 12, we start seeing a little bit more detail regarding the physical strength, both the fortifications and Jehoshaphat's army. And I believe all this is to, again, show how prosperous the southern kingdom is and how that prosperity is tied into Jehoshaphat following the Lord and the Lord blessing the southern kingdom. So all these, all these great things that are happening, both to Jehoshaphat and Judah, are because of the Lord's presence and His work among His people. So verse 12 say, says, so Jehoshaphat grew greater and greater, and he built fortresses and store cities in Judah. So he's taking this time of peace, just like many of the previous kings, to really make sure that his cities are fortified in case an attack does come. And he has them well supplied. And he's also able to create a large, massive army which a lot of commentators will play down the numbers. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But look at verse 13. He had large supplies in the cities of Judah and warriors, men of war, 
valiant men in Jerusalem. And then he's going to detail these valiant men in Jerusalem. Verse 14, this was their muster according to their father's households of Judah. So we start with Judah. Commanders of thousands. Adnah was the commander and with him 300,000 valiant warriors. In verse 15, and next to him was Jehonan, the commander, and with him 280,000. And then verse 16, and next to him, Amasiah, the son of Zikri, who had volunteered for the Lord, and with him 200,000 valiant warriors. But not only does the tribe of Judah provide warriors, but also Benjamin, verse 17. And of Benjamin, Elida, a valiant warrior, and with him 200,000 armed with bow and shield. And then verse 18, and next to him, Jehazabad, and with him 180,000 equipped for war. So when we look at this in chart form, I always like to take these sections and put a picture to them. So we see Judah has 780,000 warriors. Now, remember, these are the ones in Jerusalem. This is not the ones scattered throughout the Judean cities. Judah has 780,000, so basically broken up into three different divisions here. Adna at 300,000, Jehanan at 280,000, and Am Amasiah at 200,000. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, some com commentators play down these numbers. Because the word, the Hebrew word for a thou, for thousand can be translated differently depending on the context. It does have a, a semantic range. It does always mean the literal one thousand. It could mean a reference to a certain military unit. That is possible. But I don't think there's any reason not to take these as literal numbers. We've seen armies that have a, a great number of warriors. It's not unusual. And again, I believe this is showing the prosperity that the Lord is blessing the southern kingdom with. So why not have a massive army? That's going to make the chroniclers point. Again, this isn't just because Jehoshaphat is a great military strategist. He can convince a number of people to serve in the army. He is obedient to the Lord and the Lord is blessing him, but this is the Lord's doing. And then when we look at Benjamin, we have two divisions there, Jehoshaphat, 180,000, and Elida at 200,000. So 380,000 total from, Ju uh, from Benjamin. So when we put those two together, Judah in Jerusalem has a total of 1,160,000 warriors. Now, is that too big of a number? I don't think so. A couple chapters ago, we talked about one of the foreign nations having a million-man army. Why not the southern kingdom having that size army as well? And we end the chapter with verse 19. These are those, are they, who served the king apart from those whom the king put in the fortified cities through all Judah. So when we talk about this one million number, this is, again, just the troops in Jerusalem. Not only do we have the troops here, but Jehoshaphat stationed troops in all these different fortified cities strengthening the kingdom of Judah. Now, interestingly enough, as we move into chapter 18 next week, we're actually going to see a battle, and we're going to see Jehoshaphat aligning to someone we wouldn't think he would align with. Being a man who follows the ways of the Lord, he's going to align himself with Ahab, the king of the north. And we know Ahab from Ahab and Jezebel. Probably one of the most unrighteous people you could, or most unrighteous couple that you could point to in the scriptures. But we'll save that for next week. So, what do we walk away with? We've seen this through a couple of our kings here that the idea of seeking the Lord was key to their success. We saw it with Asa, and now we're seeing it with Jehoshaphat. Seeking the Lord was essential to his success as a king and leader of the southern kingdom. That's why he's prospering, because the Lord is working. He's honoring and blessing that obedience. But what you, I want to add one other thought here. 
in addition to seeking, we also see that Jehoshaphat was one who was avoiding wickedness. We saw that in verse 3 and 4, that he did not seek the Baals. He did not act as Israel did. So we see kind of this two-part obedience. He's doing the righteous things, and he's avoiding the unrighteous things. Which again is going to make it surprising in chapter 18 when he aligns himself with Ahab. But here in chapter 17, he's seeking the Lord and he's av avoiding wickedness. And it's a good reminder for us that we need to have that same mindset. We need to have that same practice. We are to seek the Lord and at the same time, we are to avoid wickedness. And we looked at Hebrews 11.6 a couple weeks ago in light of this. And without fail, and without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he, he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. But again, we're, we're also to avoid the wickedness. And there's a lot of examples to go to. But I, I kind of think of the Apostle Paul. A lot of times we look at Paul's writings and he breaks it up. And he, he talks about doctrine and he follows it with duty. We think of Ephesians, first three chapters, doctrine. Last three chapters, duty. But I think if we, I don't have any statistics here, but I think if we went through the duty sections of Paul's epistles, we're going to see not only does he exhort, or, exhort his readers to do something righteous, but also he exhorts them to avoid unrighteousness. So just one example and you can pull it up or you just listen to me here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And this is a, a verse a lot of people have memorized and a lot of people will get incorrect. But for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So we see the idea of, of greed here. But my point is in verse 11. He says, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So again, verse 10 doesn't teach that money is the root of all of you. Evil is the love of money, it's the greed. But verse 11, he says, he gives essentially two commands. Flee, that's that idea of avoid Avoid greed, and you could probably list all kinds of other sins and wickedness along with greed. But then notice he says, pursue, flee, pursue, avoid, seek. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And I think that characterized Jehoshaphat. He sought the Lord. He pursued righteousness, and he avoided wickedness. And that same example, I think, should be one that we follow too. Again, we're to be following the commands of the New Testament, not the Mosaic Law. So again, we're in our different dispensation. So, But I think that example holds true. Cross dispensations. So, so next week. We will continue looking at Jehoshaphat and specifically his alliance with King Ahab. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day to be together, to open your word, to study these truths. And we just pray you would help, them to live, uh, help us to live them out. And it would be all for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.